Okay, all right, so, um, yeah, so we want to do um, the second talk of the evening. Um, yeah, I have slides. Yeah. I think the microphone seems to be working. Is that okay, yeah? Are we okay right here, okay? Good, excellent, all right, that's it. Very, very impressive, thank you. Thank you. As I was past this, my name's uh, Gary Povey, I work in Vesco. I've been there for about three years. Um, really kind of leading some of the, the transformation and the things I'm going to talk about is the journey that Invesco has been on over the course of the past few years. Uh, Clayton uh, is with me as well, he's uh, one of the engineering managers so he can go through more detail in terms of the development side of things, where we were, kind of how we've evolved and where we are now. Um, similar here, I'm calling it a journey, it is a journey. We, we, we know where we were, we kind of have an idea where we want to be, how long it's going to take us, who, who knows. Um, so a few things I'm just going to take you through here. Um, I'm going to touch a bit on Agile as well as DevOps, so I think it's important that you see the catalyst for how this change kind of started to occur. A bit about our journey, similar thing around some of the challenges faced, kind of how we've implemented our DevOps process, and then we've got some flow diagrams as well to try and explain exactly where we are. Just in terms of background though, Invesco, um, some of you may, may or not know, uh, Manage about $950 billion in assets, global organization, 7,000 staff globally uh, in 20 different countries. So you can imagine the scale of change um, or the, the problems that might inc uh, we might incur when we try to bring in a change globally rather than even just regionally in one team, which hopefully would be a little bit easier. Still challenging. Um, so why did, we, why did we go on this journey? I think it's important to talk about what, what did we think Agile and DevOps was really going to achieve for us. Um, similar things to yourself there, Kim. We, we were seeing significant code releases, quarterly releases, six monthly releases, very much waterfall methodology. Often had issues because there was a lot of changes all going live, probably on a particular weekend, find the issues on a Monday morning. Um, either further changes, emergency changes on that Monday, or roll back in, in, the, worst, in the worst case scenario. Um, we were often finding as well that throughout the project, using the waterfall, we were finding that requirements were often coming up, and they're, they're very hard to absorb in the project. It's, is this in scope, is it not in scope, is it change control? Lots of bureaucracy around that whole process as well, which really wasn't giving us value, and we weren't really getting anywhere with our business partners in terms of what we were delivering as well. Invesco has grown very much organically, but also by a number of acquisitions as well. There's a very complex technology architecture, a lot of legacy systems, a lot of companies that have been integrated but not fully integrated, and technical debt uh, residing around as a result, overlapping different applications and systems. That's a, you know, a challenge with growth, I guess. We didn't have a dedicated testing capability nor do we really have a dedicated enterprise architecture function. We were trying to do that within the, within the teams, but not really thinking globally and holistically about what we were doing. I think we were in a position as well where our technology teams were becoming a little bit stale as well, a um, bit demotivated, doing the same thing over and over again on applications and code that weren't really cutting edge. It was just maintaining small enhancements, not really leaping forward. And that's kind of an evolution that we needed to get our head around about how we were going to get to the next generation of systems and applications. I think culture-wise, people were getting slightly complacent as well with the way that they operate in a number of years, used to the way that they were working. But we really want to inject a bit more energy and a bit more passion um, and to get some more agility in, in terms of our ability to respond, adapt and deliver as well. So that's kind of really the drivers of why we started to go on this agile and get what we're doing. Just such an eye on because it was our catalyst really for change. We really started to embrace the um, Spotify model, the teams to teams. So we've gone with the, the squads, chapter leads, guilds, etc. Um, we were looking for that iterative continuous development, uh, cross-functional teams rather than teams of project managers, BAs, de um, .NET developers, SQL developers, etc. We really wanted them to be joined up rather than them and us type culture that we were experiencing and too many touch points as well. By the time you've got through all these different teams, by the time you've got into production, it kind of wasn't what people wanted and they've got it all been waiting. So the other thing is obviously increasing our return on investment, delivering reliable results, our effectiveness and reliability of the systems as well we really needed to um, 
address, and we also need to unleash that creativity and innovation. So if we've gone a similar way, 20% of our, of our sprints are, are allowed for creativity, innovation, learning, just trying things out, um, which I think is super, we've seen some great benefits, like you said about that earlier as well. Um, but we have gone for this consistent agile methodology, which we can measure, um, and I think we are seeing some start to see some big benefits. But again, this was the catalyst for how we could start to adapt and get our teams to behave differently and change that culture, that mindset, that openness and ability to learn and take on some of these new concepts we were talking about. So again, you've probably seen as well the values. We were really in individuals and interactions over processes and tools. The tools weren't important to us, but it was about that mindset change, the openness, how do we get people to buy in and really be open-minded about some of the changes we want to make and how to improve the culture. Uh, work in software over comprehensive documentation, clearly with BAs, developers, testers, su their separate support, the amount of documentation and handovers you have to go through to get from one point to the other is, is, is long, a long lag time before you get from one to the other. Um, so we wanted to get away from that. Working software was the most important thing. Um, customer collaboration as well over contract negotiation. When we're saying it's going to take three weeks to do this, we're going to have it in two weeks. What can I have in two weeks? Why does it always take so long? Rather than getting them on board with this is this is this is understand that this is, this this can be com complicated. Understand the process. Collaborate with us. Work with us. Make sure what you're asking for is really what you want. Collaborate more collectively. Let us understand what it is you're asking for, and we can help you understand how you can get there. Um, and then we responded to change as well over following a plan, not six six month Microsoft project plan. Very much about stories, prioritising those stories, like bits and features, and making sure we were really delivering the value, rather than making sure it sticks to scope the entire time. So then, I guess the next step for us, our evolution, a quote there from Charles Darwin, was really about. How, what is the next step? Once we've got all of our squads behaving uh, in, in, in that um, methodology, what do we do next? So these were some of the quick insights. Wow. I'm not sure I believe all of them, but 46 times more frequent deployments. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, 440 times faster change lead time. Great stats from 2017. Um, faster to recover from failure. I can understand that. We're making <coughs> smaller incremental changes rather than big releases. Um, but again, I think the, the practices is really the bit that, that we've really focused on now, about this continuous integration, um, collaboration across the teams as well. Uh, we're seeing a lot more collaboration between the different teams. We're seeing people, like we talked about, sharing in successes, but also sharing in failures. So we've got this mantra about failing fast, <coughs> and also minimum viable product. Let's get something out there, have a look at it. Does it tick the boxes before we move on to the next stage as well? So with that, it's kind of, kind of like the continuous delivery, security testing, regulated environment like yourself, we can't really get away from that. We have to do a lot of security testing. Also monitoring and logging, how do we track progress? Are we winning? How do we, how do we track that? And I think if you measure it, these things will happen as well. Also provision of environments and configurations is an interesting one. We, I think we're not quite there yet. We would like to be there. Um, that's where it brings in some of the server ops teams and things as well though, where we, we need to start, start thinking about that bit more. So just to just look at our timeline, because this, this doesn't happen overnight, it's quite a long journey. So we, we adopted Rally back in Q3 2014, and we allowed the teams to kind of adopt as and when they wanted. It's there, use a tool set if you think it fits, etc., etc. But it wasn't really until Q2 2018 where we really started to push this and raise the bar a little bit more with the Teams of Teams introduction, an oversight committee, measuring maturity, uh, monitoring how people were progressing, agile coaches in place, DevOps skills in place, really starting to get that collaboration coming out and getting those best practices, some um, standardization um, and, and sort of governance and consistency as well. That's where it really started to kick off. Q1 this year, we've um, did a proof of concept with the Atlassian suite. And now, in Q2, we're over 60% Agile. We're now starting to work on the scale of Agile approach, and, we're, and we've now got the Atlassian Enterprise as well. So again, this is a, you've seen this slide already, but very common one, but that's where we're heading with the whole Atlassian Enterprise. Um, we'd be remiss of me to say we've done this all by ourselves. Um, we have engaged activists on quite a few of um, <laughs> <laughs> 
um, installation, training of our teams, on-site consulting, just to help us with a review of are we, are we doing this in the right way. Test manager for Jira we're implementing as well, and also <coughs> hosting the managed service, and we're migrating from Lally over to Jira as well. So quite a lot of engagements there, um, and as you said, quite a lot of um, benefits you can bring to any organization. In terms of challenges that we've faced, just a few, but number one, culture, I think probably goes without saying. That information flow, the collaboration, people have been a little bit stuck in their ways about things. We've been trying to encourage, motivate, reward people to for, for progressing this. We've seen some great stories, people that we didn't think were going to be part of this journey have actually smashed the lights out and are leading this forward now. They've become um, mentors to some of the other teams, which was really unexpected. We really want to get this shared responsibility ownership. As we've said, if a release fails, it's not an individual, it's the team. You fuck up, you succeed together, you fail together. Um, that learning from failures, I think we've probably talked about that one to death, but um, new ideas as well. We, that 20% in the, in the sprints to allow people to go away and just experiment a little bit, and do some learning, um, bring back some fresh ideas push the boundaries a little bit more and just try and see what is the art of possible. The behaviour we've, we've had to change, um, this is probably even one of, the, one of the harder ones, often told, we can't do that this way, that's not how it works, this system's complex, you wouldn't understand. It needs to be more of a, that we can do this if, let's, you know, we can't do exactly that, but let's work together or let's have a think about what we could do to evolve from where we are. We can't stay stuck where we are. We want to be number one in our industry. Also, that setting of that definition, the vision, and the execution um, has, has been important. Senior management and employee are buying into this, the little free as you're talking about. It has to go through the, the, the culture and the, <coughs> and the company, and that, that has been happening for us, which is great. On the tooling side of things, um, it has been very um, difficult, the deployment, legacy code, there's a lot of complexity there, there's a lot of integration, there's a lot of, if I change this, I don't know what's going to happen, impact analysis type thing. Um, how do we monitor whether people are adopting this, whether they're using it, how do we get some metrics on are we winning, that's very important for us. We're seeing, as Clayton will allude to as well, test automation, what used to be the BAs would go away and test um, to their spec that they wrote, um, is now built into the overall test automation and the solution that's um, arrived at using uh, behavior driven development. We've, we've really found some great benefits coming out of that, and we're actually finding that the requirements are becoming much better and much clearer as well as a result. People having to think about what it is they, they expect as an outcome. Environment management as well. Um, clearly, when you've got all these systems all integrated together, refreshing them all at the same time, testing, booking. Look in your test environment for a couple of weeks, potentially breaking it so that people can't use is a, is a real challenge. And one of the things we're looking at in our next phase is about this Docker containerization, et cetera. How do we get um, environment management or environment the developers can use to prove out their code and then take that code through the other environments as well. In the knowledge and experience side of things, we now have an internal architecture function, which is great. It gives us that governance, gives us that control give some oversight about what's, what's going on. Uh, the testing capabilities are growing. We've got our own dedicated testing on uh, um, practice now. But also the engineers are building in that automated testing using the DevOps framework as well. InfoSec has to be part of every solution, unfortunately, but it just means that there's, that's now built into our build and release. So it's not as much of a problem as it used to be. Making sure the design is right. Um, it's really come out of the enterprise architecture function. So let's just do it right and do it, do it right first time, rather than keep having to reiterate things as well. We have found potential skill set shortage within the organization to shift from where we were to where we are now, and it is a constant learning to try and upskill people. Um, generally, people are very happy about the opportunities to learn, and maybe they didn't have that in the past, but so we're seeing some morale and motivation improvements as a result of the additional money that's been invested in people to bring them up uh, the curve as well. I'd say one of the things we quite haven't, haven't quite got there yet with the um, agile as well is, uh, is product owners. So who owns an application? Who's going to do that product backlog grooming? Who's really going to prioritize for us 
um, that's still a challenge which I think we have because an application is only got about 400 pixels rather than one. So that was kind of my introduction of kind of where we've come from, some of the challenges we faced, where we got to. Um, Clayton's just going to talk through a little bit about where we've arrived at as well with some of the, um, with some of the solutions. Um, I'll, go, I'll go through that diagram in a moment. Just a quick introduction, as, as Gary pointed out, um, I, I manage a team of developers in London, Hyderabad, and uh, Houston. Uh, my background, I've been in development 15, like 20 years plus, BB2, uh, SQL Server, Oracle. Um, it, it's mainly been data space uh, development on Unix, uh, middleware, uh, but also sys, I've even done it for Massacre. Um, it, 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 it's interesting what we talked about, it, mindset change has been the biggest thing here. I mean, um, Gary talks about Agile. Uh, we've been a company, uh, I've been in Mesco 15 years, um, it, it's been waterfall driven. So that was the biggest change to introduce Agile. Uh, what, what, what you see up here is me replaying, I, I did the slides yesterday, me replaying a developer, what he went through, he went through the pipeline with me. So I'll do my best to go through this. Uh, but I wanted to start with the, the goals of what we had. So um, a few years back, we had a major outage. Um, this is through one of our database releases. Everything was mainly tested, mainly deployed incredible amount of risk, it took five days worth of outage. Um, and really, uh, with the likes of Gary, you know, our CTO, it was how do we go about reducing risk, improving quality, and that key thing is stability. It's basically our production environment. How do we maintain stability, uptime for our business partners, and ultimately provide better value. Um, uh, just, just hearing to, just hearing replaying what I heard as well. Um, to get to here, th we've been working this since the start of the year, so we're very new to this. Um, what we did before this, we did a lot of investigation work, um, you know, with, um, which I'll go through some of the sort of technology stack up on there. What, what we've built is uh, basically um, a WPF front end, so working with Visual Studio, um, that's talking, we wanted to layer a service layer, so we built REST APIs over our database, and ultimately talking to a uh, Oracle database. And uh, as I go through these slides, I'll tell you some where we need to get to. So hopefully that explains, this is my story of how we got here. Um, so right at the top of the start, you can see we, we've gone with Jira, so that's uh, working with Adaptivist to to get Jira, that's uh, moving from Rally onto Jira. That's just basically our issue board. So we manage our backlog, all our user stories, and our sprints. Um, I don't know if anyone here has worked on Specflow. Um, it's a product that does uh, behavioral driven development. Yeah, it's, in essence, it's, it's a very, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's on this, it is, it's on the next slide. Specflow, one really good thing, and we, we, we kept sort of talking about this, is how do we increase collaboration, not just within the development, the EO team, but with the business as well. Specflow allows business users to write down features of how an application should behave, work. And that they write that down in simple English. We record that on our Jira test board up there. Um, and then going through that, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much. I'll just, I'll just pick out some of the highlights there. Um, you've seen version control. We're in a bit of a transition phase between TFS and Bitbucket. Uh, I've used both. Bitbucket is very nice uh, with source tree and obviously GitHub. Um, but really what this slide is showing you is what one of the key things we had was when we made code changes, it was all just mainly just checked in. Um, what, what we're trying to do here is fire off the pipeline. So getting out, you're checking a piece of code. We're not doing it on a schedule. This is on every check-in. We're still working through, obviously, if we've, if we've got a distributor team, do we schedule the, uh, the trigger 
every hour. That, that's to be worked out. But what this is trying to show you on a check-in, it goes off, builds that code, compiles it, it runs your unit tests. Uh, we then create the artifact. The artifact in this case is just all the release files for the service and the UI. Uh, a very important box there is that uh, security scan. Uh, that's using Fortify, um, very good product. It basically gives you a dashboard, highlights uh, the risk in terms of critical, high, medium, you know, points out if you're, if, you know, for developers, if you hard coded the password, if you're not using secure encryption layers. Um, so that's a very good, puts it on the dashboard. Um, right down there, we're, we're talking about publishing, but what, what, what that's trying to show you there is just our integration pipeline. Uh, it's really, it's helping us enforce this, um, you know, with this automation and also introducing testing and security. Any questions on this one again? You Oh, 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 that's a good, good, good question. Um, this is incorporated into uh, the pipeline. I mean, when the builders are coding in that second box up there, yeah, they'd be running their own test and ensuring that in all parts. But we've got this. Um, we've got this as part of the pipeline now. Is that is that okay? Yeah. Sorry, but it's your pipeline. I mean, you know what? It's well tested. This as I as I mentioned, this is being replayed. Well, the developers told me, so... Well, uh, the thing is, yeah, yeah. tests, they're not yeah, yeah. building anything, it's using resources for nothing. Right, okay. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> right, this one, I'm sure you'll see some more uh, holes in this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, right, okay, so this is our uh, continuous delivery, deployment, whichever way you want to call it. Um, these are some of the challenges here, so as, as I... I Pointed out. I mean, our our organisation is very ideal. So it's we've got very you know we've got our infrastructure team spread out. Uh, we've got a lot of change control in place, we, and we've got a lot of gates to get anything into production. Um, and I'll come down to that bottom box at the moment. Uh, this was our, and I said we're still building this out. Um, where we as, at the top, you basically set up your environment. Um, you get your files ready, and what we do, we, we've got a CI environment, uh, our continuous integration, it's a server which runs this spec flow, and those are your actual integration tests. Um, so what those are is, um, it's deployed, and we'd actually run where we're hitting the underlying database, so we're not doing any mocking, this is actually, that, that run integration test is actually hitting the underlying database. And we've got, um, okay, if you've used SpecFlow, you can put all your um, your responses and your actual results into Excel, and that's how it is checking against. It, you, 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 can take, you can test it through products like Postman. You go in, you hit your API, uh, you, you can get your response back, and you, rec you can record all of that in Excel, and all that's doing is checking against those expected results. Um, what, what we're trying to do there, I mean, I, I did show this to one of our, um, I'd say, more experienced DevOps engineers. He did highlight a couple, couple of, as I said, holes in this. He was saying, you've got one pipeline there for everything. Um, shouldn't you be splitting that out? Uh, why, uh, you know, he was talking about um, how you're publishing uh, to different environments. Well, this is my understanding from what the developers say. Once we've gone through and we've got in uh, integration testing, that passes, it automatically runs step one to four. So that trigger would go off and then deploy to dev with the, setting up the dev, uh, the dev environment. Uh, again, it then repeats. Uh, and we have got a gate there on, on UAT. Uh, again, this is going back. This, at the moment, that gate is just an email approval. It'll come to one of us. Uh, we're going to TFS and approve it. But onto the production one, this is the one where, again, I think this is going to take a lot of work. Um, we, we use ServiceNow. Um, we've, we've managed to basically automate uh, releases to the CI environment, dev, and UAT. At the moment, production, it, it, it's controlled. 
Uh, so we do have to raise change controls. Uh, we have to go to QA meetings. We've got to get our support team sign off. And then we've got a two manager uh, sort of sign off to get the, the change into production. Um, and really, these are some of the challenges on there, which I manage like managing different rules across pipelines. Um, environment management, okay, we are a very big IT organization. Um, I've put there where our ultimate goal should be, uh, which is, you know, you make a change, it's in production at an X one hour later. I mean, that's, you know, it's also seamless automatic releases. Did this slide here, it was just um, where we want to get to. Um, our top bit is more around challenges we've had around the environment. Um, we are evaluating products such as uh, Toad and uh, Redgate for database automation. Um, again, the, the production deployment, that's more for conversation with the senior management on how we get around some of these controls. Um, I've mentioned MuleSoft where we're, we're stuck. Um, it's an improvement concept of our company. They're gearing more towards our sales teams at the moment, but you know, where can we leverage that for API, hosted monitoring? I've mentioned Docker there. We've not had time to actually uh, investigate this product. Uh, I've, heard, I've, I've just been to meetings like this, really just to see what the opportunities are there. And then really I put that, what else is, what, one of the reasons Gary and I are here, we want to hear what's out there. As I said, very early stage of DevOps uh, for me and my team. Uh, a lot of upskilling, as Gary mentioned. Um, and really, it's, uh, you know, what else is out there? And really, how far can we take this? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Excellent, Gary. Clinton, thank you very much. Um, have you got a question for our presenters? Over there. Uh, so let's get to you. This way, then. There we go. I think, I think that's one of the things that is evolving, especially with the new enterprise architecture function, but really what we're trying to have is some frameworks that we can, uh, uh, we can take and then we maybe have, we adapt and, and model from them. But really we, we don't, when we've got this many people working in technology, there's over two and a half thousand people, to try and get some sort of consistency so our run team can deal with any issues overnight rather than developers getting called up at 2 a.m. We have to have some sort of similar design patterns uh, that the company follows and try and get some sort of consistency. But you're right, it's, it's hard. And that will keep on adopting and keep on uh, evolving as we move forward. But to try and get some sort of consistency and framework is kind of where we're heading. Excellent. Okay, so um, once again, um, thank you very much to 